organization in the lab. Uh, so as a, it'll work with me, sorry. Okay, uh, so as just a sneak peek, so uh, at the smallest length scales, we use uh, chromatin electron microscopy or chromium. Uh, and this specifically labels DNA for electron microscopy imaging, along with scanning transmission, electron microscopy, or chrome stem. And so importantly, this has a resolution below three nanometers. Um, this can be done in fixed cells, uh, but the limitation for this method is that um, as we have a small field of view, our statistical power is kind of low. Using STORM, or Super Resolution Stochastic Optical Reconstruction Microscopy, we can use either live or fixed cells to look at molecularly specific information uh, below 20 nanometer resolution. And of course, we use partial wave spectroscopic microscopy, or PWS, and this was a technique developed in-house that allows us, without the use of exogenous labels, to look at the uh, dynamic measurements of statistical properties of chromatin. Um, in which we can look at a resolution between 20 and 200 nanometers. So starting with the first, uh, so chromium is this DNA specific labeling technique that was originally developed by Ellisman and O'Shea, uh, first published in 2017. And so as you can see here, first cells are fixed with glutaraldehyde and then they're stained with JAK5 fluorescent dye, which binds to double-stranded DNA. And so upon excitation of about six minutes, uh, the DRAC5 molecule releases a single oxygen molecule, and this reacts with DAB solutes in order to form these electron-dense polymers, of which we can identify using these dark precipitates within the nucleus. And to create contrast free imaging, these precipitates um, are further enhanced using reduced osmium, um, and so this binds to DAB with high affinity. And so unlike transmission electron microscopy, the STEM HADF mode, which stands for high angle annular dark field mode, provides a high contrast. And importantly, its signal is a linear function of chromatin concentration. And so aligning a tilt series collected by this imaging allows us to have a 3D reconstruction for high resolution chromatin structure. For example, as we can see here, this is an example of this tomography where we have a DNA stained in yellow. Zooming in further into this structure, we can see that chrome stem can visualize fundamental details of chromatin organization. For example, you can see here chromatin density as a heat map um, where you have high DNA density from heterochromatin staining in blue. And then zooming in even further again, we can see that we can visualize DNA density all the way at the level of nucleosomes. So here we see nucleosomes in pink with linker DNA surrounded in green. And so using chrome stem, our lab has observed that chromatin forms into spatially separable uh, fractal packing domains of about 100 nanometers in radius across different cell types. And so from a chromatin density projection such as this one, uh, we can first find local chromatin maxima, and then we find the chromatin domain centers. Uh, and so here we see uh, this projection of a packing domain. And so not only can we obtain information about chromatin conformation, but we can also extract statistical packing domain properties that are relevant to transcription. So for example, we can look at the size, the scaling, the chromatin volume concentration, which tells us about chromatin density, and finally the packing efficiency. And so like many polymer systems, chromatin adopts a power law scaling relationship between the number of monomers, which is proportional to the mass of the polymer, and the space that it occupies within a domain. And so for each domain, as you can see here, the average mass scaling curve exhibits a power law scaling regime with similar chromatin packing scaling. However, at larger length scales, there's a gradual decline uh, or deviation, sorry, from this initial power law behavior. And that's because chromatin is a heteropolymer made up of monomers, which are nucleosomes. And at different length scales, these monomers and the whole chromatin chain are influenced by different things like loop extrusion or phase separation, for example, or other DNA modifications. And so because of this, there are separate, there are separate regimes or length scales uh, with different mass scaling behavior. And so the scaling factor D tells us about this physical structure of chromatin. Um, this is the chromatin packing scaling or the mass density scaling. And further, using chrome stem, we can also see that the radial chromatin density of a domain decreases smoothly from the core 
towards the periphery. And so in our lab, we characterize the statistical properties of chromatin over time and across cell populations. But as I mentioned, chrome stem can only be done in fixed cells. And so we need a method using live cells to do this. So we can apply a uh, dual partial wave spectroscopic microscopy, um, which has a greater field of view, and of course, doesn't use exogenous labels. And so with this instrumentation, first you had broadband white light that's passed through a UV filter to get rid of UV components. Then this backscattered light is collected and spectrally filtered through this liquid crystal tunable filter. And finally, multiple backscattered wide field monochromatic images are then collected to produce a three-dimensional image cube. And so from this setup, we can get different measurements. For example, with PWS, we can capture the intracellular structure at length scales below the diffraction limit by measuring the spectral or wavelength variations in the refractive index. However, using the same system and in the same cells, we can also get measurements of dynamics. So specifically, dynamic PWS allows us to look at the temporal variations rather than the spectral variations in the interverted signal this allows us to retrieve information on macromolecular motion, for which we call fractional moving mass. Um, and so importantly, we can also combine these techniques with ones like these, spectroscopic single molecule localization microscopy, which gives us information about the molecular composition of our chromatin packing domains. So as you can see here in these images obtained by our collaborator, Dr. Hao Zhang, this technique is allowing for simultaneous spectroscopy and super resolution imaging of fluorescence molecules. And importantly, uh, with this technique, we have uh, single molecule sensitivity, we have higher precision, and we also have um, a greater capacity for multiplexing capabilities. Even further, we can combine this technique with spectroscopic nanosensing or PWS. And here, as you can see, we can therefore co-localize these packing domains in red with markers such as active RNA transcription, like RNA polymerase II, or even with, um, uh, with markers for heterochromatin in blue, like HUK9 trimethylation, or active markers such as HUK27 acetylation. Um, and so uh, finally, we can visualize chromosome-specific loci in either live or fixed cells while still preserving chromatin structure and nuclear integrity. And so one technique we use for live cells is crispr serious, which is a set of CRISPR guide RNA scaffolds for signal amplification and genome and imaging. And so these scaffolds have been adapted to carry multiple binding sites for fluorescent proteins, um, which allows for enhanced brightness as well as a higher signal to noise ratio in comparison to older methods like CRISPR rainbow, as you can see in these example images from this paper in 2018. However, uh, the caveat is that this requires high copy uh, chromosome specific loci in the genome of which there are a limited amount. And so in fixed cells, we can instead use razor fish, which stands for resolution after single stranded exonus exonuclease resection. Uh, so importantly, this is a non denaturing fish method. Uh, and therefore, as I've said, it preserves uh, chromatin structure and integrity. Uh, the caveat to this is that this requires cycling cells because you need to incorporate this BRDU and BRDC. So briefly how this works is you have DNA that is labeled with a bromine nucleotide analog, and this can be nicked by UV light exposure um, following a sensitization process using either DAPI or HOSH. Um, and then uh, these NICs will serve as a substrate for exonuclease uh, 3 digestion which allows the creation of single strand DNA regions that are available for the hybridization with labeled fish probes. And importantly, as you can see from this paper in 2022, both of these techniques, um, including here with razor fish, can be combined with immunolabeling so that you can not only visualize these, genes, these genome specific loci, but you can also pair them up with measurements um, or uh, fluorescent measurements of uh, stains like here in HP1 alpha and red. And so altogether, now we have this multi-scale chromatin nanoimaging platform, uh, which allows us to look at chromatin conformation across multiple length scales in both live and fixed cells. So we can obtain information all the way from the DNA level to the cell population level. And so in summary, we've now seen that our multi-scale chromatin nanoimaging platform demonstrates that chromatin folds into these spatially separable fractal packing domains. We see that domains show polymeric fractal behavior and radially decreasing density from the core to the periphery, 
And finally, using this platform, we can start to determine how chromatin structure, dynamics, and transcription influence each other across length and time scales. So next, as I mentioned, I'm going to be applying these tools I just talked about to understand chromatin organization at the nuclear periphery. So what structures are actually found there? Um, and so here on the right, we can see this image of a, a human mesenchymal stem cell collected by my colleague, Dr. Agarwal. As we can see, um, there's a clear uh, nuclear lamina, and right under that, you have these domains of which we refer to as lamina-associated domains. And so uh, these domains are particularly enriched in the B compartment, which consists mostly of heterochromatin, and therefore markers such as HUK9 dimethylation and trimethylation, or HUK27 trimethylation. And then below that, uh, you have more euchromatin, which tends to localize with lamin A rather than lamin B. Lamin B. Um, and these markers are more associated with HUK4 methylation along with HUK9 acetylation. And so as you can see from this uh, chrome EM image, we have most of the chromatin density uh, here. It's darker staining at the nuclear periphery other than around these nuclear pore complexes. And so in order to determine how loss of nuclear lamins at the periphery impacts chromatin organization and dynamics, we applied this oxygen-inducible degron system or the AAD system. And so importantly, this is a reversible system. Uh, we have created these in the parental cell line ACT116, which is a colon carcinoma cell line. And we targeted both lamins B1 and B2 simultaneously along with this fluorescent uh, M clover marker. Uh, which we obtained from Dr. Masato Kanamaki, who originally created this AAD system. And so briefly, um, first we created the progenitor cell line expressing this OSTR1 protein, which originates from rice. Um, and this expression is under a doxycycline inducible promoter. Um, and so TR1 forms a complex with these SCF components, as you see here. Um, we also have our protein of interest, which are lamin B1 and B2, that is fused to this mini AAD degron tag of only about seven kilodaltons in size. And so in the presence of auxin, um, which is a plant hormone, um, this mini AAD tag and OSTR1 interact, um, and this allows for polyubiquitination and subsequent proteasomal degradation of the protein of interest. And importantly, if we were to remove auxin from the cell media, then we would start to have protein expression of our protein of interest once again. And so in order to confirm that the addition of this mini AID and clover tag does not alter proper localization, we use immunofluorescence. As you can see, we have lemon B1 here stained with the AID, uh, uh, with, the AID with the tag. Um, and this co-localizes with lemon A, of which they've been shown um, time and time again to have significant overlap. As we can see here in the merge, they do. And so overall, we can see that this does not alter proper localization. And then as you can see here, we verified that 24 hour treatment was sufficient to induce a reduction of both lamin B1 and B2. Um, and we did this using both Western blots to look at protein expression along with flow cytometry assays. Um, so based on confocal imaging, we had uh, noticed an increase in nuclear deformations in the presence, uh, for example, with uh, the amount of nuclear blebs, uh, the presence of micronuclei, or even with rupture, as you can see from these representative images here. Uh, further, based on flow cytometry, we also detected a slight increase in DAPI stained nuclear area upon lemon B1 and B2 degradation. And finally, we wanted to assess if these changes were associated with um, an induction into apoptosis. And so apoptosis is programmed cell death, and we use a flow cytometry-based assay to do this. So very briefly, as you can see here on the left, as a cell undergoes programmed cell death, uh, you have phospholipid flipping. And this allows for uh, these phosphatidylserine or PS to become exposed. And the presence of calcium then you have fluorescently conjugated an X and V, which can bind, and then we get this readout here with the flow cytometry. So overall, what this tells us is that 12 hours, 24 hours, or even 48 hours of auxin does not induce apoptotic or necrotic cell death. Next, we wanted to quantify mesoscale chromatin organization in the genome. Um, and so in order to do this, we used high throughput uh, chromatin capture, um, also known as HiC. 
So this is a method for quantifying the long range physical interactions in the genome uh, where you have uh, coupling proximity um, based ligation along with massively parallel sequencing. And so from these, we get this two dimensional heat map of which we can just like a Google images uh, or Google Earth map, we can zoom in and out of to get different features. So for example, we have topologically associated domains. As you can see here, their peaks are demarked by these chromatin loops. Um, we also have chromatin compartments and even higher, we have chromosome territories for which you can see that the red indicates contact frequency. We can also zoom into these maps to see at the bottom of this uh, track here in black is a nuclear lamina contact frequency, meaning that where you have more of these peaks, you tend to have more contact with the nuclear lamina associated with these lamina associated domains. As you can see, looking at the Eigenbecker tract right above, these are associated with the red, which is a B compartment that is transcriptionally repressed. And alternatively, when we look at those uh, regions that do not have this contact frequency, these overlay with the A compartment that is transcriptionally active, along with markers of loop extrusion, such as cohesin and CBCF, which are known to bind um, outside of TAD borders or LAD borders. And so in high C maps, contact frequency decreases very strongly with genomic distance, where the rate of decay of contacts with genomic separation reflects the polymeric nature of chromosomes. And this can tell us about the global folding um, patterns of the genome. And so importantly, um, the probability of contact, P, uh, between two monomers that are separated by some length, N, uh, along a linear chromatin chain follow a power law scaling relationship where S is a contact probability scaling exponent and is an important measure which tells us about overall chromatin connectivity. So upon 24 hours of oxygen treatment to reduce the expression of lamins B1 and B2, we see that looking at all chromosomes, we don't really see any obvious effect in terms of connectivity. We perhaps saw a very slight darkening of the maps overall, but it was nothing very significant. Then looking at conic probability scaling, as you can see the control, it gives us a result of 0.93, whereas with 24 hour oxen, we only drop by 0.01, so we're at 0.092. So overall, this indicated that we don't have any minimal, we don't have much changes that occur upon depletion of both B-type lamins. Looking at the eigenvectors, we chose a chromosome two, which uh, tends to be more associated with the nuclear periphery, along with chromosome 19 that tends to be more associated with internal regions. And we saw that in both, uh, we didn't see um, many instances of compartmental switching. However, looking at these eigenvectors in the purple, where we look at the B compartment, we can see that maybe they get a little bit smaller. However, it was nothing that was very obvious. And finally, looking at TAD size and TAD number, we can see that these also did not change very substantially. And so as we didn't see any changes at that higher length scale upon joint type, um, joint B-type lamin degradation, we figured that maybe the effects of this inhibition were limited to the nuclear periphery. And so LADS have been primarily identified using this technique called DAM-ID. This stands for DNA adenine methyltransferase. And so how this works is you have expression of a fusion protein of DAM and a nuclear lamin protein, oftentimes lamin B1, and then the methylated DNA fragments are isolated, they are amplified by selective PCR, and then they're sequenced to result in this nuclear lamina contact map of which I previewed you um, just recently. And so using publicly available uh, DAM-ID data for hct 116s against lamin B1, we first wanted to see uh, the relationship between uh, conic probability scaling and percent of lamin B1 coverage. So as you can see here, um, there is a strong inverse relationship between the two. And this makes sense because the rate of decay of contact should be slower within a lamina associated domain due to the repressive and compact B compartments within LADS. So next we looked into how this changed by segment. So as you can see, looking within LADS between the two conditions, we didn't notice much of an increase upon lemon B1 degradation. Um, and looking into uh, non-lab regions, we saw there was a slight decrease. However, we were interested in the fact that there seemed to be more similarities in the region um, in comparison to uh, between uh, treatments. And further, looking at TAD size, 
as we also saw that between conditions, they didn't really seem to change. However, we did notice again that TAD sizes within LADS seem to be larger than those of non-LAD regions. And also TAD numbers appear to be higher um, in LADS than in comparison to non-LAD regions. So next we wanted to see how this conduct probability scaling would change within and across LADS versus non-LAD regions. So here in blue, we are looking at contacts across not in non-LADS as, well, um, as well as to other non-LAD regions. In orange, we're looking at contacts within LADS and then to other LAD regions. So first we look at chromosome three with preference to the nuclear periphery. Starting from left to right, here we're looking between LADS and non-LADS. And as you can see, um, we see that within LADS, we have a lower uh, conic probability scaling in comparison to non-LAD regions, which we already knew based on the previous slide. However, looking between across non-LAD regions or across LAD regions between the conditions, we didn't really see much of a change in conic probability scaling. Looking at chromosome 19 with more preference at internal regions, we then didn't see much of a change, but we did see that within LADS, it was again, slightly lower. Um, however, looking between the conditions, these numbers appear to be even more similar than with chromosome three. And so overall, even though we saw a very small change, the greater difference occurred between um, LAD regions um, at uh, chromosome three um, near the periphery. Uh, and so next we applied dual PWS in order to understand average chromatin packing scaling and dynamics. Again, we are looking at chromatin packing scaling and fractional moving mass. And so our molecular simulations have uh, verified that D and S are inversely related. So if you recall, we only saw um, about D going up, sorry, S going from 0 0.093 to 0 0.092. And so we can expect that we would maybe see a small increase in D, if anything. And so from these representative D maps, along with this violin plot, we can see that there was an increase overall in chromatin packing scaling. However, this shift was uh, relatively small. However, looking into dynamics, we saw that there was a nearly 20% increase in fractional moving mass. And so overall, this indicates that there is increased chromatin mobility upon removal of B-type lamins. Then we reasoned that if lamin B1B2 depletion would lead to detachment of LADs from the nuclear periphery, or in general, just movement, we might see that there's also a shift in heterochromatin. And so using confocal microscopy, I looked at individual line projections um, where we can see in red, we're looking at H3K9 dye or trimethylation for heterochromatin along with H3K27 trimethylation. And as you can see in the control condition, we see that there's more of these peaks towards the edges of the nuclei. Whereas in the oxygen condition, we start to see they become more uniformly distributed or with peaks uh, gravitated towards the middle. Um, for the opposite phenotype, we then looked into the successful marker of H3K27 acetylation. And we see that in the control, we have a more uniform uh, distribution, whereas the auction treatment indicates that we have more movement towards the periphery. Further, we looked into the corrected total cell fluorescence to get an average idea of how these markers would be reduced. Uh, for example, we looked into H3K27 trimethylation and we saw um, a reduction along with an increase in H3K27 acetylation. Uh, and this result for H3K27 trimethylation was confirmed using a Western blot with gap GH as a loading control. And so these results shouldn't really surprise us because as we can see from this paper in 2020, LADs are more associated with these repressive marks. So if we disrupt these LADs, then we would ideally consider that these would also be impacted. So next we wanted to quantify DNA compaction. Um, to do this, we use spinning disc and focal microscopy. So in comparison to wide field microscopy, which uses pinholes to uh, reject out of focus light, spinning disc and focal microscopy instead has this disc, uh, this disc that spins at really high speeds and has multiple pinholes. And because of this, we not only have a faster acquisition, but we also have reduced photo damage and we have a sharper image. And so we then wanted to look at confocal micro uh, this microscopy to look at the coefficient of variation uh, which is a method used to assess the degree of heterogeneity of DNA signal across the nucleus, 
where you just take the standard deviation divided by the mean value of nuclear pixel intensity. Um, and so as you can see, upon 24 hours of oxen treatment, we have a slight reduction in the coefficient of irradiation, which would indicate that lamin B1 and B2 loss promotes chromatin decompaction. Finally, we wanted to see if relocalization of heterochromatin and chromatin decompaction would be paired with any gene relocalization from the nuclear periphery. And so for this, we applied CRISPR Sirius. So we looked at two different gene targets, the first being on chromosome three, again, with preference towards the nuclear periphery, as well as TCF3 on chromosome 19, uh, with more preference to uh, the nuclear interior. So the first thing we did was look into the number of loci per cell. As you can see, we have a median of about two, and this would be expected as these cells are diploid. And then we measured the distance from the center or relative distance. Um, and we can see that for both of these targets, we actually saw that they shift to more internal regions upon lambda B1 and B2 loss. And so overall, this is telling us that we have a greater shift of things moving inwards when we reduce uh, these constraints at the nuclear periphery. And so although overall the changes in mesoscale chromatin organization uh, were muted, uh, we did hypothesize that these alterations in chromatin localization and dynamics could still be paired with changes in gene expression. And so we did bulk RNA sequencing uh, at 12 and 48 hours of treatment, along with a six day wash off of oxen to see if the genes uh, would be restored. So as you can see in the 12 and 48 hours, we did see substantial uh, differential gene expression. However, um, we were quite surprised to see that between the conditions, we actually didn't see any clear trend uh, between up or down regulation of gene expression. Um, and then looking into the six day wash off treatment, we saw that overall, um, some of these genes did go back to their original expression. However, we did have um, a few that remains uh, differentially expressed with slightly more of them being uh, upregulated. And then finally, uh, we looked into uh, where these genes were located based on um, their relation to being within LADS or outside of LADS. As you can see, uh, looking at the 48 hour time point, we can see that the majority of differentially expressed genes occur outside of LADS, which again, shouldn't be too surprising as these areas are considered to be more transcriptionally active. And if we um, were to mess with LADS, we would imagine that we would have differences in gene expression of those genes nearby. Um, and importantly, we also saw that there was somewhat of an increase in differentially expressed genes, even within the repressed environments of LADS upon 48 hours of oxygen treatment. And finally, we next looked into the functional consequences of this degradation, as you can see here from these bulk RNAC uh, maps. So um, very quickly, we can just see that within uh, 12 hours of treatment within LADS, most of the terms that came up were related to structural diseases, whereas those outside of LADS were related to cancer. Um, and so overall, this gives us an idea that LADS might contain transcriptionally quiet states for genes and upon depletion of these lamins at the periphery, they unevenly regulate genes, um, which leads to this altered transcriptional states, and these can contribute to laminopathies or uh, even cancer. So finally, um, for this section, we talked about how structural components of the nuclear periphery, specifically B-type lamins, contribute to genome architecture, dynamics, and gene regulation. We talked about the, how the AID system allows for targeted protein degradation of essential proteins in a reversible manner. And finally, we talked about how disrupting B-type lamins preserves mesoscale chromatin structure, but still can promote chromatin dynamics and differential gene expression, both within and outside of LADS, along with inducing nuclear deformation. And so my last uh, part of my talk will be on uh, covering some of the ongoing collaborative efforts to assess chromatin structure and function. Uh, so for example, at the top left, I'm working with Dr. Andrew Stevens and Dr. Luai Almasaha to look into how shifts in chromatin dynamics may underlie nuclear deformations, um, for example, nuclear blebs, independent of lamin perturbation. We're also working on the right with Dr. Vivek Shinoy and Dr. Malike Lakdemyali. Um, as you can see here, I've sent to my collaborators these lamin AID cell lines that have been stained with H2B. Um, and here we can use this to assess the relationship between epigenetic reactions and chromatin laminate interactions further. 
On the bottom left, we can see here, we're working again with the same collaborators to look into the relationship between transcription and chromatin organization. And finally, we're working with multiple collaborators uh, to assess the relationship between chromatin confirmation and connectivity in both live and fixed cells. So very briefly, this is uh, work from Dr. Vivek Shinoy and Dr. Malike Lapidamyali, um, who are our wonderful collaborators. And as you can see, so um, they have used theoretical analysis accompanied by numerical simulations uh, to predict that lat thickness is determined by the synergistic contributions of both the strength of chromatin lamin interactions, along with the rate of histomethylation. So to do this uh, experimentally, they applied tristatin A or TSA. This is an HDAC inhibitor, um, meaning that it would induce uh, acetylation. And from my own work, I've seen that it also significantly promotes the formation of nuclear bloods. And so very briefly, as you can see from these storm point cloud images, along with these boron identity plots, which tells you about the spatial compaction level of chromatin, along with the zoomed in images, we can see that TSA treatment not only reduces heterochromatin domain radius, but also reduces the methylation level. Further, looking at panel F, uh, we can see that they um, saw that H3K9 dimethylation density is correlated with H2B density. Therefore, they used H2B as a marker for these LADs, and between the two conditions, they measured uh, nuclear lamina thickness. And as you can see from these plots, TSA treatment not only reduced lamina thickness, uh, nuclear lamina um, LAD thickness, sorry, but also lamina affinity. And so we plan to work with our collaborators to determine if these same results hold in the lamin B1 and B2 AAD cell line um, with auxin treatment to degrade these lamins, TSA treatment, or EZH2 inhibition. So quickly, what EZH2 inhibition uh, does is it loses these H3K27 trimethylation marks. Um, and so from these results in U2OS, a bone carcinoma sign, uh, cell line, we can see that D very slightly decreases. Um, and in HCT116 with TSA, we see that it substantially uh, decreases. And from my confocal images here, you can also see that upon auxin treatment or GSK343 um, treatment to inhibit EZH2 or TSA, we do see um, somewhat of a reduction in uh, HOK27 channel methylation. Looking at lamin B, um, I want to just point your attention to the fact that TSA treatment very clearly disrupts the nuclear lamina, as we can see here uh, with lamin B1 and B2. Uh, we also see a presence of more of these uh, nuclear bloods in all of the conditions, as I previously mentioned. And um, so next, we are trying to understand the relationship between chromatin organization and transcription. So as you can see here, we have used PWS and STORM to be able to determine that these packing domains um, tend to have active RNA polymerase uh, localized around their boundaries. Um, and further using both computational modeling simulations as well as high resolution imaging, we can see that chromatin packing behavior of these domains exhibits a complex bi-directional relationship with active gene transcription. So looking at this plot here, we can first see that increasing D first increases transcriptional um, activity by increasing the binding efficiency of molecular uh, or transcriptional reactants. However, after a critical packing density, then the crowding effects start to decrease the molecular mobility of these reactants to such an extent that gene expression becomes repressed. And so overall, this tells us that the chromatin packing behavior of these domains is directly influenced by active gene transcription. But a remaining question in our field is how does transcription itself impact this organization? So our current results indicate that active gene transcription and epigenetic reactions synergistically regulate mesoscale genome organization. We have hypothesized that these domain cores acquire heterochromatic marks as domains mature, densify, and grow in part as a result of transcriptional activity. So as you can see here, using multi-label uh, single molecule localization microscopy in combination with PWS imaging, we can co-localize packing domains with markers of repression such as H3K9 trimethylation or accessible marks like H3K4 trimethylation. Work from my colleague in the lab, Nico, who looked at labeling density, um, has shown that the domain cores have these repressive marks 
whereas those of the interdomain space tend to have those of more active transcription marks. However, the quantitative impact of transcription and histone modifications on the size and distribution of these domains is unclear. And so work from uh, Vivek Chinois lab uh, has uh, developed a mesoscale theoretical model. And this investigates the relationship between heterochromatin domain sizes along with loop extrusion rates from these domains. And so as you can see from this schematic, there are several um, processes such as loop extrusion, supercoiling, or chromatin laminate interactions that contribute to this relationship. So to experimentally validate these models, we can use actinomycin D. This is a transcription inhibitor, which is also a DNA interpolator, and it blocks transcription elongation. So first, using uh, this Clicket Alexafluorophore imaging kit to measure total RNA, you can see from my confocal images in the RNA section that actinomycin D does in fact halt transcription. Um, and we also see these significant effects uh, just in the DAPI stain images as well. And so across different cell types, I looked at average chromatin packing scaling for the entire nuclear area. And as you can see, there is a substantial decrease uh, in all of these violin plots, um, other than maybe HeLa, but overall we did still see a reduction in D. And these are accompanied by these uh, D maps for the representative images below. Uh, now, just using 10 minutes rather than an hour of actinomycin D treatment, we can use live cell PWS to be able to track the same nuclei over time and see how domains change. So as you can see, after just 10 minutes here in BJ fibroblast cells, we not only see a 7% decrease in average nuclear D, but we also see that the packing domain projection fraction, which is a fraction of the nucleus occupied by packing domains, increases by decreases by almost 30%. And so overall, this tells us that domain structure and transcription, again, have this bi-directional relationship. The theoretical models from Vivek Chinois lab have also predicted that upon uh, transcriptional inhibition, uh, the average size of domains will increase. And so we think that an average decrease in nuclear D could uh, indicate that there's an aggregation of these domains into fewer, denser, and larger domains as shown in the schematic made by my colleague, Lucas. And so using crumb stem, we looked into these BJ fibroblasts and we saw that not only is there an increase in domain radius, but there's also an increase in domain density. Further work from Malike Lakadanyali's lab using storm and HeLa cells um, showing these boronoid density plots uh, can show that these inner domains along with lamina associated domains are also substantially impacted. And as you can see from these plots, they get um, much more dense. And then finally, we're trying to elucidate the relationship between chromatin conformation and connectivity. So for example, in the loop extrusion model, you have proteins like cohesin rad 21, which our collaborators in Leiden and Aiden lab have shown using high C that loss of uh, rad 21 with the AAD system induces uh, loss of all loop domains. From my dual PWS experiments, I've shown that it can very slightly lower chromatin packing scaling along with fractional moving mass. And so we would consider that we might see a little bit of an increase in conduct probability scaling, which is exactly what we see from publicly available HiC data sets. In fact, we see a nearly 25% increase in S upon this degradation. Now looking into CTCF, which also allows for loop extrusion as an orientation boundary element in which, as you can see from this uh, GIF, we have a loop that's being extruded on one side by cohesin until it's stalled by a convergently oriented CTCF site. From the high C maps, you can see that there is a loss of some loop domains along with the weakening of TAD boundaries. And so from my PWS imaging, I've seen that there is again a very small decrease in D. However, there was no change in fractional moving mass. And then looking into uh, connectivity in mouse embryonic stem cells using publicly available high C data, Again, we see that there is a very small increase in conduct probability scaling. And so the theoretical models from Vivek Chinois lab also predict that upon loss of loop extrusion, as you can see here, uh, then we eventually have a higher domain size. So as you can see here in mass neuromonic stem cells, we have seen not only an increase in TAD size, but we've also seen a decrease in CDC depletion. Uh, from these MESCs uh, using the AAD cell line. 
And so in summary, uh, we talked about how epigenetic, ooh, not that yet. Uh, we talked about how epigenetic reactions and chromatin lamina interactions can synergistically regulate mesoscale scale uh, structure of LADs. We also talked about how active transcription and epigenetic reactions synergistically regulate mesoscale genomic organization. And finally, we've determined that uh, domain structure and transcription have a bi-directional relationship. And so with that, uh, thank you so much for attending this talk. Thank you to my lab, especially my wonderful advisor, Dr. Vadim Bachman, my committee members who have given me lots of support and advice, along with my collaborators of who much of this work would not be possible, and of course, uh, my funding sources. Uh, and with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Emily. That was a beautiful talk and a beautiful body of work that you've put together during your PhD work. Um, I see that questions are starting to come in. I'll start with Malika's question. She texted me that uh, she'd like me to ask it. So uh, she says, beautiful work, Emily. Uh, it's really impressive to see such nice agreement across a wide range of imaging modalities. Uh, she's wondering if you've thought about depleting lamin AC in these cells and whether you expect to see similar or different results from lamin uh, as a result of lamin AC depletion compared to B1 and B2 as you did. Yeah, good question. So we have thought about it. We have not done it yet. Um, but I would imagine that it maybe wouldn't have as similar results. I mean, they could be similar, but just considering that the whole reason we use lamin B was because they tend to have more preference um, with the nuclear periphery. Uh, and so we wanted to just choose proteins that were as close to the nuclear periphery as possible. Whereas lamin A has more preference with the nucleoplasm. So even though we could see similar results, I would expect that they might not be as uh you know, as as drastic, even though overall we didn't really see huge substantial changes uh with um mesoscope organization. Yeah, and I guess it also depends on the levels of lamin AC in these cell types as well. So uh, yeah, exactly. I, I see Dennis has a question. Dennis, uh your hand was raised. Do you want to ask your question? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, we can hear you. So I I, I I missed this slide early on, which is the introdu introduction of this auxin system. Uh, I, I I understood that you did the tried to do this degradation over a twenty four hour period. Is that correct? And then did much an, uh, your analysis? Yeah, is that yeah? Yeah, I'll just put the slide up to help. Yeah, so we found that twenty four hours was optimal. Just very quickly, I'll go to this next slide. So as you can see, it does start to decrease earlier than that. We just saw from our Western blots that at 24 hours, it was no longer detectable. Okay, so um, is is this occurring at, at at the envelope, or is it occurring because that's yeah, if you if you know the dynamics of of lamin B, right? It it assembles after division, right? But it's solubilized during during mitosis, and uh, mm -hmm. and so yeah, there's a couple of questions there. You know, is it, does does this if you block mitosis does this not happen does this degradation not happen is that so so we should be thinking about these changes kind of in relation some you know many of the things in relation to um chromatin you know uh, condensation after mitosis you know what can can you comment on that is this is this degradation occurring in the cytoplasm of this phosphorylated uh, lamina, lamina, lamina proteins, B1, B2? So as far as I understand, uh, this lamina degradation should um, inhibit lamins B1 and B2 throughout the nucleus. Um, you know, and it, even though I haven't shown those results, so we do know that lamin B1, the tagged proteins themselves are degraded, but the actual endogenous lamin B1 and B2 are also degraded. Um, in terms of how they went to the cell cycle. Um, I haven't really looked into that. Although I do know that when you disrupt lemon B1s and B2, uh, there are some effects on just cell cycle progression. Um, but that's about as far as far as I'm aware with that. Right. But but you know, so during during mitosis, this is phosphorylated and solubilized, right? In the cytoplasm, mm -hmm. the, the lamin, all the lamin proteins, right? 
and so easier to degrade right but uh, but if if you degrade it just at that phase if that's and 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 you know that's why maybe you require that 24 hours for maximum effect right as opposed to i, I don't know how fast the system otherwise is for soluble versus membrane bound but but you know if it's completely degraded all in all these cells that we're looking at during mitosis right that that can be a little bit different than if you're really degrading during interphase yeah 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 i see your point um as far as i know at least from my imaging um when i've just just confocal imaging at least um looking at just the reporter the m cover tag um, even when I sell, when I see that cells are dividing, I still don't see any sort of green fluorescence. Um, so I'm not sure how well that answers your question, but overall, I can at least say that just from my imaging, yeah. as I've seen cells going through mitosis, I've at least seen that there is no longer a GFP signal. And and, and then you did, I'm sorry, but you did say it is affecting subsequent division, this degradation, right? Is that? Uh, so I don't have... I don't have those results. That's more of just based on what I've read in the literature uh, um, that I know that if you interrupt lamins, yeah, it can impact uh, cell cycle progression. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks. I, I think Thank just to pick up on, I think just to pick up on Dennis's point, I think mechanistically it would help you tease apart. Is it establishment of the domain versus maintenance of the domain? And another way that I was thinking that you could do this, assuming that there isn't a large cell cycle effect after one, I imagine these cells are probably doubling every 18 hours or so. You could let your degradation go on for 36, 48 hours. You probably get into two cell cycles and start to look at if there's a more dramatic effect. Um, yeah, those are really good points. Um, you know, I, I definitely do think we should look into that. Um, I'll have to talk to my to my collaborators and my PI and and see what they think about that. Um, you could start yeah, with like, thank you, for you have a nice year. readout with the fish data. So you could read out using that to see if there's a more dramatic phenotype and then do some of the more uh, in-depth mm -hmm. analysis if there's something interesting. I, I had a question and then I see um, Madhura has a question as well. So in your expression analysis, Emily, I wasn't, I mean, you might've mentioned it and I might've missed it. So of the, there was like a couple hundred genes that went up and down in your first time point, And then there was like 800 or so that went up and down at the 48 hour time point. And I was just wondering, is it the same genes that are going, getting more dysregulated or is it a new class of genes? And um, I, I, I don't know if you've done that analysis. Uh, in terms of the same genes, I guess I haven't done that exact analysis. Overall, we were just trying to see based yeah. on our log fold change, like how yeah. many genes were differently expressed yeah. in general. Yeah, like you see that like SOX4 is going down and then, I don't know, CEM, IMP is going up at 12 hours. Are those same genes down and up at 48? Um, anyway. Oh, I see. And that's probably yeah. pretty, um, pretty simple analysis that um, you could do. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely true. I mean, I do see, yeah, I see your point. So I see CEMP here at 12 hours and it continues to be yeah. upregulated even further. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's definitely something we can look more into. Andrea, did you have a question? Um, I did, but we do have another question in the chat if you want to take that. Uh, yeah, Faria is interested about your TSA conditions. Um, and so I was curious about the TSA conditions you used uh, with which you observed the significant uh, nuclear deformation in the cell line. So maybe you could speak a little bit to how those experiments were done and uh, maybe if you remember what concentration of TSA or things like that. Oh man, I should have uh, written that down. I just did these treatments, but I can say that it was a 24-hour treatment with TSA. Um, I believe it was a low dose. I could I could look back at my at my notes really quickly and let you know. Um, but yeah, we we tried to not make it too high of a dose, and we made it more uh, where it was um, in line with the treatments that we've seen in the literature for uh, similar cell types. Great, thank you. Uh, feel free to email me if you if you want to know, and I can uh, 
I can let you know exactly how it was sent to. Mandora, did you want to ask your question? Yeah, I'll ask my question. We have like maybe four minutes. Sure. Um, it might be, this is not a PWS question. This is more of a how transcription works question. Um, in, the, in the very beginning, you had an image where you were co-localizing um, heterochromatin markers or RNA polymerase with your PAT regions. Um, could you pull that up if you don't mind? Is this what you're referring to? Um, I can't. See, yes, this. Um, so here in red, you have the packing domains and like your green is RNA polymerase too. Um, what are you expecting in general with like how transcription works in the parts that are not red versus the ones that are red? Is the RNA polymerase just hanging out or is it intentionally there to transcribe something? Yeah, so for that, uh, I'll actually go to a different slide. Um, so from this schematic, this is what we think is happening. We are currently working on um, another publication where we are working to see if our hypotheses are correct. But what we think is actually happening is that in these packing domains, they tend to be uh, having this heterochromatic domain core, um, as you can see from these densities from storm images. Um, and we think that outside we have active uh, transcription, which is not only uh, just because we have an interdomain space, we have a higher um, concentration of these accessible marks. But because of that, we think that there's not only active transcription, as you can see, we also think that there's processes like um, active loop extrusion, um, along with even uh, supercoiling that happens. So. We think that transcription around uh, this heterochromatic core um, of these packing domains could be stabilizing uh, these domains as they continue to grow and densify and mature. Okay, that's that's really interesting. Thank you. And then just one more question: Have you possibly like overexpressed some transcription factors to see if you can capture changes in chromatin architecture with this method? I have not. I know other groups have, uh, but personally, I have not only looked at uh, degradation. That's okay, thank you. It was a really cool talk. Um, there's, I think we have a couple minutes for one last question from Dennis. It's in the chat. Uh, Dennis, did you want to ask it? Are you still there or? Uh, yeah, 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 it's in the chat, right? So can you show that you, so you had a, you hit a bunch of cancers regarding the up and down regulation. I just didn't catch, are those genes down uh, for, uh, this, yeah, this, these are in panel C. So this, mm -hmm. this, do we say that there's genes that are both up and down there? And, 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 uh, cause yeah, as you say, these are all cancers, right? And, um, yes. and so what is, is, is there, are, are there some key genes there that are giving rise to this, that you know, cell cycle, for example, right? You know, do you, uh, do you yeah, know? So I mean as, as far as we've looked into it, um, so these uh, cells weren't just like up or down. It was more so that they were just, their expression changed uh, just so that they were differentially expressed. And then we paired that with a DEM ID uh, data to see how they uh, corresponded with LADS. But in terms of looking into, um, into that, we didn't really do that as much just because that wasn't... Uh, as big of a focus for for the research, but it's definitely something that we can look into. Okay, thanks. Great, I think it's uh, noon, so uh, uh, let's all thank Emily for a really wonderful talk and a really wonderful body of work.